Um, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming uh, and welcome to our, our fourth talk of the term. Before I introduce the speaker, I just want to uh, talk about a few of our next upcoming events. So obviously today um, we have Joe with us. Next week we have Kayla Black, who will be talking to us about the true value of skepticism. Um, and the week after we have David Helfand talking about surviving the misinformation age. Um, and so the various links to these um, are available on our social media and will be put in the chat. And as ever, this is being recorded um, and it will be put up on YouTube. So uh, if you prefer not to be on the recording, please do uh, keep your cameras off. Um, I'll quickly introduce our speaker for today. Uh, Joseph Yuzinski is a professor of political science at the University of Miami. Uh, he studies public opinion and mass media with a focus on conspiracy theories and related misinformation. Additionally, he is co-author of American Conspiracy Theories and editor of Conspiracy Theories and the People Who Believe Them. Um, you may recognize him from his many media appearances on platforms such as 538, the New York Times, the BBC, or the FT, in which he discusses a wide range of topics such as cults to QAnon to COVID conspiracy theories. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Joe Yuzitsky. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Is my screen sharing properly? Okay. Yeah. So um, for today, I didn't want to talk so much about conspiracy theories in general, because I think for a group like yourself, where you're already against pseudoscience, I don't think I need to convince you uh, that conspiracy theories are bad or can lead to dangerous outcomes if uh, acted upon in deleterious ways. Um, what I want to get to instead with an audience like this is, is perhaps something a little more meta. And that is thinking about what we're getting wrong about the things that people get wrong. So how can we think about conspiracy theories as skeptics? And what are the things we need to be most concerned about now? Um, and I say that because I don't think this audience is a bunch of raving conspiracy theorists. So, <laughs> um, so that's the title of my talk. Um, before I begin, I will just say, you know, conspiracy theories are a difficult topic. It's like broaching religion or politics with anybody. Uh, people can have very strong views and they don't necessarily want to change their views just because you disagree. And one of the problems with conspiracy theories like religious views and political views is they're not always open to being changed. If somebody's convinced that satanic pedophiles control the government, sending them a fact check or a link isn't gonna change their mind and confronting them about their belief is probably just gonna upset them. So um, in a couple of weeks in my country, we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving and there's gonna be a lot of <laughs> Uh, arguments over the table, given the way our politics is right now, people arguing about COVID or Biden or Trump or whatnot. And just as much as I was brought up to, to believe that, you know, we should avoid in polite company discussions of politics and religion, conspiracy theories very much fall into that same category. Because these ideas get to what is it we believe about the world? What is it we believe about who has power? And what is it we believe about um, what the powerful are doing with their power when no one's looking? And those can be things that are very sacred to us and we may not wanna negotiate those ideas. So they become very difficult for us to um, talk about. And I, I did this at Thanksgiving a couple of years ago. I said, let me test my thesis on my family. So I brought up conspiracy theories and um, that was the last time I was invited to Thanksgiving <laughs> six years ago. So um, <laughs> that tells you how that goes. Um, when I give talks in the public, I always expect disagreements with conspiracy theorists over their particular conspiracy theories, which I usually don't share with them. Um, but I found lately many of the disagreements I'm having are with the anti-conspiracy theory crowd. Um, I'm disagreeing with skeptics. I'm disagreeing with people who are pushing back against conspiracy theories. And I'm finding that in some ways, it's the skeptics who sometimes hold um, unskeptical beliefs about certain propositions. And that they are the ones who are holding, on occasion, uh, beliefs that run contrary to the best available evidence 
or they believe things that don't have any evidence for them one way or the other. And that's sort of uh, it's some of those propositions that I want to get to today. So my hope is that as skeptics, you know, we're open to having our beliefs challenged. Um, that yes, of course, we shouldn't believe in ghosts and that Invermectin is a good thing to take, even though there's no evidence for it. Um, but are those beliefs coming from a place of skepticism or are we just dogmatic? Um, and that we just happen to be landing on the right beliefs about some things, but maybe some things were wrong and maybe we're not open to changing our minds. My hope is that we are indeed open to changing our minds when there's evidence pointing in the other direction. So let's begin then. So we've heard a lot about conspiracy theories lately, and most of what we hear is not particularly good. Um, so, for example, uh, The Economist says from the Congo to the Capitol, conspiracy theories are surging in the last couple of years. Uh, Politico says you're living in the age of uh, the golden age of conspiracy theories and the Washington Post is concerned that you might fall down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole. And yes, that's the Washington Post and not Cosmo. Um, but nonetheless, they have a quiz. So take the quiz and find out if you are indeed a raving conspiracy theorist. Um, concerns, particularly during COVID, that conspiracy theories are making the pandemic worse and that these conspiracy theories are spreading everywhere, that COVID conspiracy theories are destroying our relationships with our loved ones, and that pieces of misinformation um, rife with conspiracy theories like the pandemic video, which was supposedly popular a year and a half ago, is spreading everywhere and turning everyone into a uh, COVID conspiracy theorist. We've heard the same last year about QAnon too, that it's conspiratorial, dangerous, and growing. And that's what CNN, that's what CNN told us, Washington Post told us that QAnon, even though it's been banned from many social media platforms, is still growing and even thriving uh, despite the social media bans and that their extremist ideology is just getting started. So that all sounds bad, right? That, that these conspiracy theories are big and getting bigger and um, that even the, the, the ones that we consider extreme or lacking in evidence um, are in fact going mainstream not a very good view to have of the world. Now, with all of that sounding as bad as it does, one thing that the media has done for us is to find a villain. You know, if conspiracy theories are on the rise, there must be a new uh, reason for that. And that is, of course, <laughs> that they've identified social media. So we've been told in the last few months that 9-11 conspiracy theories are big and getting bigger because of social media, even though that event is 20 years in the past, uh, that it's social media that's driving COVID conspiracy theories, and even things like TikTok are driving children to become raving conspiracy theorists. And of course, the call is Congress needs to do something in my country in your country would be parliament needs to hold these social media platforms accountable for what they're doing and with all this negative coverage of conspiracy theories and social media's role in spreading them the public in the u.s has become convinced um, that social media is the cause of a new age of conspiracism so 70% of Americans on polls tell us that conspiracy theories are out of control. A majority tell us that people believe conspiracy theories more than they did 25 years prior. And three quarters of Americans blame social media for driving this new age of conspiracism. So no wonder Congress wants to act and do something because that seems to be what the public wants them to do. But it isn't so easy. There are serious policy implications whenever we um, try to stifle free speech, whatever our good intentions might be. I mean, first of all, rules coming out of Congress for technology probably would not be very good. Um, and they would potentially stifle innovation. And rather than break up monopolies, they run the danger of um, 
establishing and holding in place monopolies. Um, the regulation of these online markets could increase costs for consumers and decrease choice. And at the same time, even worse, um, the regulation of speech could have a chilling effect and there could be collateral damage. And we're already seeing that already. In, in the race to take down conspiracy theories of misinformation, oftentimes the tech companies are taking down true and valuable information. And, and this can end potentially with censorship and manipulation because if you put government in charge of deciding what's true and what's not and what needs to be censored and what doesn't, they are going to have particular interests um, which might lead them to make these decisions, such as anything that's critical of government may be more likely to be censored, even if it's true. So we want to avoid um, those, you know, potentially worse outcomes than what we have now. So the questions I want to answer is, are conspiracy theories indeed on the rise? What about uh, COVID-19 and QAnon conspiracy theories in particular? Are conspiracy theories driving deleterious behaviors and violence and is social media responsible for it? And those would be very important questions to answer if we want to take action and start regulating speech or regulating online content. So I'm going to define my terms, explain how beliefs form. I'm going to put this media narrative to the test, which is we're in the golden age of conspiracy theories and social media is to blame. And then I'm going to talk about how that narrative is getting it wrong. So a conspiracy, uh, just to define my, my two prime terms here, is a real thing that happens. And it, it involves a small group of powerful people working in secret for their own benefit against the common good and in a way that undermines our bedrock ground rules against the widespread use of force and fraud. Watergate in the U.S. makes a great example where Richard Nixon and his uh, staff undermined the Constitution illegally. And we know it happened. We call it a conspiracy because the FBI, Congress, and other knowledge building institutions investigated. They had experts come to these conclusions about what happened. And that data and evidence is open for anyone to challenge should they want to do so. A conspiracy theory, on the other hand, um, is again a small group operating in secret for their own benefit against the common good and in a way that undermines our bedrock ground rules against the widespread use of force and fraud. But here it's an accusatory perception and we don't assume that it actually happened. We, we use the word theory after conspiracy to denote that uh, the experts have yet to decide that this is what happened. And they have yet to decide this with open data and evidence that anyone can challenge. So uh, the authoritative account of the Kennedy assassination comes from the Warren Commission, which concluded it was one person, Lee Harvey Oswald, that killed Kennedy in 1963. If you assert that the CIA or some other group did it, then you're engaging in conspiracy theory. Now, this doesn't mean that any conspiracy theory is necessarily wrong. It could be true. It just means that it's not the authoritative account by the appropriate experts with open data and evidence yet. It could be the case that in some years from now, new evidence comes to light. And what we thought was conspiracy theory is now considered the, a real conspiracy. So why do people believe these ideas? Well, the real question we need to ask is, why do people believe anything? And the answer is for a whole lot of reasons. People come to beliefs through all sorts of pathways, right? So there isn't one reason. And oftentimes I'm asked by people, why do people believe conspiracy theories? As if the answer is going to be because they were dropped on their head or they're just stupid or something like that. There's no reason. We all partake in conspiracy theories one time or another, uh, one conspiracy theory or another. So there's never going to be one reason that explains all of it, right? But here are some of the major reasons that I would um, put forward from, from the growing body of literature. The first is that people have group attachments and identities. And this leads us to interpret the world through this group lens. So it's rarely my group that's conspiring against everyone else. It's the other groups that I'm competing against that are conspiring against my group. 
So Republicans don't think Republicans are out to get them normally. They think Democrats are out to get them and vice versa. Um, because of our group attachments, we also engage in, in listening to our elites. So if we have trusted leaders out there, we listen to them. And if they engage in conspiracy theories, then we're going to listen to them and we'll adopt those conspiracy theories. On top of that, we also have a set of dispositions and worldviews that drive how we interpret the world. So if we view the world through a conspiratorial lens, which I will call conspiracy thinking, um, then we're going to see events and circumstances through that lens. And we're going to say, hey, it must be a conspiracy that caused that to happen. Now, some people have that disposition very strongly. So to them, everything is the product of a conspiracy and other people have it very weakly. So they, they don't tend to interpret things as conspiracies very often. People's information environment can drive this. So depending what media they're listening to, what their information sources are, who the, what leaders they listen to, who's in their social circle, um, that is also gonna drive what they believe about the world. Now, keeping in mind that people tend to self-select into information sources based on what they already believe. So again, you wind up with these feedback loops, people choosing information that tells them what they already believe because they like hearing um, what they want to hear about the world. People's personality traits can drive what they believe. One thing we've been finding lately is that people with antisocial traits tend to buy into antisocial ideas, right? So, what types of people believe that no one died at Sandy Hook or that the Holocaust was fake? Well, we tend to find that those are people who have higher levels of narcissism and psychopathy and Machiavellianism and have uh, uh, um, who, who, who are also prone to conflictual interactions with other people. And that makes sense because those are sort of antisocial ideas. And then finally, you know, there, often there's an assumption out there that people can only believe in conspiracy theories if they hear it from someone else, but that's not really the case. It's people can make up these things too. You put together, you know, a set of personality traits and some worldviews and some group identities, and people can just decide for themselves. Aha, the other side must be behind this, whatever this is. So, for partisans, which is drives a lot of this in the US, they're seeing through their partisan lenses and saying, ah, it's the other side that's up to no good. And at the same time, they're listening to their leaders. Um, so for example, if Trump says the election was rigged, then they're gonna believe the election was rigged, right? It's nothing inherent with them. It has a lot more to do with the fact that one, they're Republicans, they're upset that they lost and their trusted leaders are telling them it was rigged. So that sort of drives what's happening there. So I'll just give you my favorite example of how these cues work in, in real life. Um, in 2012, this guy named Herman Cain ran for the Republican nomination for president. He didn't get it, Mitt Romney got the nomination instead. Um, but his claim to fame was that he had been a successful CEO of Godfather's Pizza, which is a prominent pizza chain out in the Midwest of, of the US. As he was running for president, he, uh, it became known that he was, Herman Cain was both a Republican and associated with Godfather's Pizza. It just so happened that at that same time that he was running and getting a lot of media coverage, uh, Harvard was doing a repeated brand study on Godfather's Pizza, which he no longer worked at. And what they found was that during that time period, Republicans started to like Godfather's Pizza more and Democrats started to like Godfather's Pizza less, right? Of course, no matter who you are, it's the same pizza and it should really taste the same. But the point is that these, these lenses, which we have, these dispositions are operating, um, whether we know it or not, subconsciously, and they're driving how we interpret, they're driving how we interpret the world. So that's what leads us to decide who the heroes and villains are and what schemes those heroes and villains are up to. So um, to, I mentioned earlier um, that one of our dispositions is conspiracy thinking. 
Um, and I measure this on our surveys with statements like this. So these aren't specific conspiracy theories. These are just very sort of bland statements designed to get under the hood to somebody's underlying worldview. And these are questions that aren't necessarily true or false, but what we find is some people will strongly disagree with these, other people will strongly agree. Um, so, for example, much of our lives are being controlled by plots hatched in secret places, even though we're in a democracy, a few people run things anyway, the people who run the country are not really known to the voters. So some people might strongly agree with this, but again, they're not facts per se, other people might disagree. So what we find in our polls is that we tend to get people agreeing and neither agreeing nor disagreeing. So somewhere in, you know, in the middle or slightly towards the agree side. When we put the answers to these questions together, we give a score to each of our survey respondents. And what we find is that those who are more strongly agreeing with these statements, i.e. they have higher levels of conspiracy thinking, they tend to think that more groups are out to get them and they tend to be very uh, likely to believe in conspiracy theories that we ask them about, no matter what those are. The people on the lower end believe in far fewer conspiracy theories, right? So this is a fairly good measure of just getting to this underlying worldview. So we can think about a basic model of information reception where information comes in about the world, our dispositions that we have, our partisanship, our conspiracy thinking, our personality traits, interpret that information, which leads us to have a particular belief or not. So just putting that together, it doesn't leave a lot of room for information to have that much of an effect on our beliefs. Because first of all, our dispositions are driving what information we self select into. And we have these psychological filters, our dispositions, which are telling us how to interpret what information we do come in contact with, right? So Conspiracy minded people are going to seek out conspiracy theories. They're going to seek out information that tells them what they already believe. And if they do hear something that contradicts what they believe, their, their dispositions are going to find ways to ignore it, to work, to work around it. So let's start asking the empirical questions. Are Americans believing conspiracy theories more now than they have in the past? So this is what, you know, if you read any newspaper today, this is generally what they're arguing. Beliefs are increasing and it's due to social media. So the expectation would look something like this. Beliefs at any given time in conspiracy theories should be greater than any previous time. And if we were to poll on individual conspiracy theories, we should find that they're all being believed more now than they were at any point in the past. And we should also find that people are more disposed to conspiracy theories too, because that seems to be the argument out there. People are just believing in this more now. Their worldview should be more conspiratorial now than it was at any time previous. So let's take a specific case. Right when the uh, pandemic started in March of 2020, I put out a, a, a national poll in the US and we asked people if uh, COVID was being exaggerated to hurt President Trump. And we also asked if it was a bioweapon um, purposely created or deployed meant to injure people. We got about 30% agreeing with each of those. Um, but from March 2020 to June 2020 to October, uh, for the exaggerated uh, conspiracy theory, no change. And I pulled it again recently and again, no change. For the bioweapon idea that it was purposely created or deployed, um, between March and May of this year, again, no change. So it did not increase over the course of the pandemic from, from when the pandemic initially started in March of 2020 here. So no increases. So things like the pandemic and other online misinformation came and went, and we never found evidence of increases of these beliefs um, from time one to time two. So if we look at other conspiracy theories that we polled on in the summer of 2020, and then again a year later in, in the summer of 2021, whether coronavirus is being used to 
uh, force a dangerous vaccine on people, that Bill Gates is behind it, or that we're going to get tracking devices in our bodies. No increases, more decreases than increases. And even misinformation like hydroxychloroquine can cure it, or 5G is responsible for it, or disinfectant is good for curing COVID. None of those things increased, despite all these warnings that misinformation and conspiracy theories are spreading everywhere. Moving beyond that, claims about QAnon were very huge in 2020. And the claims in the media was that QAnon beliefs were big and getting bigger, it had gone mainstream, and then it was a product of the far right. Now, putting aside the logical inconsistency there, which is how can something be both mainstream and far right, um, let's see if these claims are true. Well, in 2018, um, I started polling on QAnon, and I put out a feeling thermometer which asks people, rate on a thermometer from zero to 100 how much you like QAnon. And the average rating um, in 2018 was about a 24. And I've repeated that poll both in Florida and nationwide um, several times since. And the mean rating has only gone down. It has not increased. If we ask people, um, are you a believer in QAnon? Um, in 2019, um, just the answer to that straight up question, we got 6% uh, of Americans agreeing. Um, and then we asked, or 5% of Americans agreeing in 2019, and only 6%, so not a significant change, um, two years later in 2021. And we don't find major differences between left and right in their QAnon beliefs. So it's just not the case that QAnon is believed by people on the far right. Now think about that for a moment. It's not like I really got into Ronald Reagan, then I read Milton Friedman, and then Satanic Baby Eaters. It doesn't follow from that. So if you if you listen to QAnon people, they're not espousing a lot of far right views. They have a mishmash of views, right? Some are on the left, some are on the right, some are social conservative, some are economically liberal. Um, but they're not cohesive ideologues in the way we normally think about it. And what seems to be driving them much more is antisocial uh, personality traits, anti-establishment views, and that they don't like the entirety of the political establishment writ large. It's not so much left-right ideology or Republican-Democratic partisanship. And just to put these numbers here into perspective, I put in um, the latest number I had on belief in JFK conspiracy theories, which comes in around 56%. And if you had polled this in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that number would have been higher, it would have been 80%. So while the journalists are saying that QAnon is mainstream and big and taking over, it's one of the least believed conspiracy theories that I poll on, whereas things like JFK are far more believed yeah, aren't getting that much media coverage for how they're taking over the country, even though they are majority beliefs, some of them. So never big, it doesn't seem to have grown, and it's not, it's not really far right or even right in a way we normally talk about it. Um, recently, I just completed a project where I polled on not only the COVID conspiracy theories and QAnon conspiracy theories I just showed you, but also um, 37 other conspiracy theories that had been polled on previously, um, either by myself or by other polling houses at some point in the last few decades. Of those 37, only six showed an overtime increase, and those increases were between four and 10 points. Uh, 16 of those conspiracy theories that we re-polled on had no significant change in one direction or the other and 15 were a decrease, and those decreases ranged from 3 to 31 points. So, of course, all of those conspiracy theories, the average change over time was about negative 5 um, percentage points. So we don't see evidence that these beliefs are increasing. And just to look at Kennedy conspiracy theories, just a few weeks after the assassination in 1963, 50% uh, of Americans believed that it was a conspiracy rather than a lone gunman. That went up to 
for decades, and it's only come down in the internet era and in the social media era. And there is no shortage of JFK consp conspiracy theory materials out there. It's on TV all the time. It's always in the newspapers. It's ubiquitous here. Um, nonetheless, it's going down, um, as are many others. In terms of our general measure of conspiracy thinking, I've been polling on that since 2012 in nationwide polls. And with that, again, no increase in the average amount of underlying conspiracy thinking from people. So a flat line, no increases. And, and with that, we're not finding big increases in the social media era either. Um, and if you follow the literature rather closely, as much as there is, are many concerns about fake news and misinformation and disinformation, which are well-intentioned, um, and we should work to limit these things. Um, but um, newer, newer works on things like echo chambers suggest that those chambers aren't that big, and many people aren't really trapped in them, that we're not really experiencing an infodemic that maybe we're not in a post-truth world. It's not really clear that people are believing more wrong things now than they did in the past. Um, instead, what we're finding is that self-selection tends to explain people's use of online information and that people are often seeking out conspiracy theories and misinformation because they already agree with those ideas. Um, in my country, there was a big argument that Russia had played a big role in flipping the election for Trump. But careful studies don't find strong evidence for this. So it's not good that Russia tried to interfere, but whether they influenced anyone's vote, um, that's more of an open question. And there isn't good evidence for that at this point. And, and if we think about it, when it comes to things like politics or conspiracy theories, most people aren't really paying much attention. You know, what are people doing online? They're booking travel, looking at porn, getting dates, booking restaurants, whatever they do long before they're chasing down their conspiracy theories. So if you look at web traffic, for example, even when Alex Jones was at his height a, a few years ago before he started getting banned every year, I mean, he was getting not anywhere near, Infowars, his website, wasn't getting anywhere near the traffic that a New York Times was. And if you look at recent scholarship, I mean, what online environments are, is a lot of people self-selecting in who might you know, maybe a colloquial way to say this is you have assholes selecting in and they act that way online. And this is who these people are. So if you're getting a lot of online rancor, it's not because Facebook or Twitter is making people that way. It's because there's a self-selection going on here. People have something they want to say and they want you to hear it. So if we were to step forward from beliefs and into thinking about actions, what's driving conspiracy uh, theory um, behaviors? Um, is it just an idea gets in someone's head then they go and act deleteriously or is there something more complicated going on? Um, so the typical model you might read in a journalistic account is something like this. You have otherwise normal people walking around then they slip on a banana peel, they join the wrong Facebook group and then all of a sudden they're committing domestic terrorism or killing people or doing all sorts of um, terrible stuff. But is that what's really going on? Um, so what I would say is really happening is that you have people sort of self-selecting in who already have a set of dispositions that make them conflictual, that make them want to act out, that maybe um, make them predisposed to acting in a way that is somewhat unhealthy. Um, and that's what you get. So perhaps what the online information is giving them is maybe a direction for where to put their action, but it's not just turning people wholesale into murderers, um, domestic terrorists and whatnot. So for example, um, last year, there were a lot of write-ups going on about QAnon believers, for example, who are acting out on their beliefs. And this is from um, some NBC coverage of a, of a person who went to a Target department store and trashed the mask aisle um, because she was upset about masks. And apparently she had been spending a lot of time on QAnon websites. 
And the coverage is something like this. People find themselves believing in elaborate conspiracy theories about Bill Gates, 5G, vaccines. Um, then they join communities. And then within days, they believe that Trump is waging a secret war to save traffic children from Satan worshiping baby eaters. Um, then they start acting out on these ideas. Now that's putting a lot of weight onto information coming in. That's somehow it's almost brainwashing people. Um, but then when you read down to paragraph 15 in the same article, then you realize that this person um, was having a depressive episode and wasn't being treated for her bipolar disorder. And um, given that she had lost her job and was in social isolation during the pandemic, now you're getting a much more full picture. So it's not just some social media posts that were driving her to act the way she did, but a whole bunch of, of things um, that were probably more explanatory. So one thing I, I, I want us to all be aware of is that tech panics abound. If you go back in time, people have been afraid of every new technology. Uh, uh, and all, you know, whether it was music being blamed for suicide, or people or novels being blamed for delinquent behavior by children or arcade games being blamed for turning the town into a honky tonk atmosphere. Um, things get blamed all the time. And if you go back in time, it was books, the printing press, music, jazz, heavy metal, country music, um, Dungeons and Dragons, the role playing game, all being blamed for all sorts of things. And that's no different with what's happening now with social media. And we have to take a step back and take a deep breath and say, is the evidence for all these things we're assuming it does really that bad? Because when I was your age, the social devil was TV. Kids are watching too much TV. They're watching too much TV. TV's destroying our nation's youth. And now, um, I think it was just a little while ago, The Guardian in your country ran a headline saying, Kids should watch more TV and stay off social media. So um, there's always something new to be afraid of. Um, and when you read these headlines, and this one is from The Guardian over there too, some of it really shows a particular bias against these particular companies. And you can like Mark Zuckerberg or hate him, but he's not a Bond villain, and I don't think he's coming for your children. Um, but this is, this is sort of where we are. So there's good and bad news out there. And the good news is that conspiracy theories aren't increasing and our new communication technologies aren't destroying our society by pulling us into a post-truth wasteland. Um, the bad news is, however, that people believe in conspiracy theories, sometimes a lot more than we like. And those levels are sometimes uncomfortable whether they're increasing or not. And yes, sometimes people do act on their ideas. And for that reason, it's very important that we work to make sure people have better ideas that are more closely tethered to truth, rather than to conspiracy theories. Um, but this doesn't, this is not a new problem. It doesn't have a new cause. And if we want to blame anyone um, for having bad beliefs, it's just the fact that we're human. The algorithms aren't writing conspiracy theories and forcing us to believe them. We're putting the conspiracy theories online and seeking them out and adopting them. And the problem is people, um, not, not the technologies. So that's the good and the bad news. Uh, thank you for listening and I'll, I'll take any questions. Thank you very much for that talk. Um, now we're gonna open it up to some questions. So I know uh, I definitely have some questions and I know some other people on the committee have some questions. But it's probably good if we start with uh, other people in the audience. If I look through the chat here, I'll just go with the first one I see. So um, it's up to you. Let me know if you would rather uh, say the question yourself or I can read out in the chat. But the first one is uh, Neil Cutland. Uh, yeah, hello, thank you very much. Um, so my question was, um, given that, I think your starting point at, at, at one point was uh, the media are telling us that conspiracy theories are on the rise and it's all to do with social media. And um, you know, cons conspiracy theories are, are um, getting bigger and bigger. However, when you did your research, you found that that simply wasn't the case. 
so my question really is is what is behind that is it simply that conspiracy theories in the media sell newspapers so to speak or is there something else behind it i mean i'm i'm nearer your age joe than uh, much of the audience here and i too remember the the whole notion that you know black sabbath and led zepp and so forth were corrupting our children and or at the time i was one of the children but you know and so the, the notion that nothing is new is very comforting what has happened is the medium has changed but i'm still intrigued about why you think from your research the perception from the media is that this is getting worse where the reality is it really isn't so um i i went back through headlines for several decades and coverage of conspiracy theories always says it's getting worse in the 1960s and the 70s 80s 90s they said this is the golden age and they're believed now more than ever you know now they say the same thing it's just they say it quite often, right? But they've never had any systematic evidence to back up any of those claims. And that's sort of the problem. And of course, it couldn't always be true or else we really would have gone off the conspiracy cliff. Um, what I would say about the last few years is this. Um, when I first started studying the topic around 2010, I started a Google alert on the term conspiracy theory. And I would get back just a few hits a day of news articles with the term conspiracy theory in it and none on the weekends. Around uh, halfway through 2015, that number jumped to between 50 and 100 articles a day, every day, even on weekends, and that continues till now. And just my, this is somewhat anecdotal, but my personal experience is that I took 250 interviews from journalists in 2020 on this topic. So I, I think what partially, partially what happened was because of Brexit, and because of Trump getting into the race. Conspiracy theories became a big deal because of those outcomes and because political elites were engaging in that rhetoric. And that sort of forced our journalists to start covering the topic and to covering that rhetoric, right? So that's sort of what's driving some of it. And then the, the part of, well, why are they saying it's worse now than ever? Part of it is that that's what journalists do um, rarely do you get a headline so, that says, hey, things are the same today, because that's not news. Um, so generally, the, the coverage tends toward the negative. And, and I, I think some small part, some small part of this has to do with that social media is competition. Um, and we've seen this before. You know, if you look back to that, uh, oh, God, who Orson Welles' War of the Worlds, when they did a radio program about aliens, um, and it made it sound like aliens had just taken over New Jersey, when in fact they hadn't. Um, the media coverage of it was that there was mass pandemonium everywhere people heard this. That's what the newspapers said. But there's no evidence that there was any pandemonium and people weren't even paying attention to this alien thing. And, and the explanation is, well, why, did, why were newspapers saying this? Well, because radio was, was the competition and they wanted to get them regulated. So. I, I think there is some some amount of turf war going on here too. How much that explains it, I don't know, but it's certainly a, at least a small ingredient. Oh, thanks very much. I really enjoyed your presentation. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Uh, okay, I think the next one I see in the chat, and then I'm going to jump in with one because I'm just selfish like that. Um, is uh, Francis? If you want to go ahead, or well, I can read it out if you prefer. Oh hi, yeah. Um, I mean that was just a. Uh, potential uh, the paradox about our view on sustainability theory. Uh, just, I'm a sustainist, that's why I thought that word. Um, our view on conspiracy theories is, you know, how we view conspiracy theorists and the kind of cognitive biases going on and, and the whole thing that, you know, bad news travels faster and we remember it for longer and it creates a bigger impact in our mind. That's potentially how we're viewing conspiracy theories. Uh, theorists at the moment, but from um, I'm currently uh, postgrad um, in sustainability, and part of the thing we're looking at is conspiracy theories and post truth era on uh, climate change and stuff. So it's really reassuring that your kind of professional opinion is that it's just as it has been, because um, I guess that's less of a problem in loads of ways. Um, but I guess if I had one problem uh one 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 question and this is 
not really much to do with my particular research, but just things I've been reading in the literature. There's lots of, um, I mean, don't get me wrong, I know very little about US politics, um, but I've read bits and bobs of literature linking higher amounts of conspiracy theorists with Republicans, with Trump's rhetoric, um, and reading lots of these, everyone seems to be presumably of democratic and liberal uh, political viewpoint themselves. I've yet to read an article by a conservative or Republican. Um, is this what you found or uh, are people, do people just have a tendency to be conservative and believe in this or is it just because of Trump or you know, is it all true and the Democrats are just out to, you know, brainwash everyone? So there is a schism in the literature. So a professor at Cambridge, uh, where you are, Sandra van der Linden, in the, psychology, in the psychology department, has a paper where they make the argument that it's the right that is more conspiratorial, more conspiratorial than the left. Um, so they argue for a asymmetry. Um, my work shows evidence that there isn't this asymmetry. And my argument is that the right believes certain conspiracy theories more than the left, but vice versa. It just depends which conspiracy theory you're talking about. So when we poll on other conspiracy theories, we find that the left is um, likely to believe in some too. So anything about Trump, the left is gonna say, yeah, he's definitely conspiring or, or something like that. Um, whereas you ask, ask the right, do you think Obama or Biden is up to something? They're gonna say yes. So which conspiracy theory people believe in comes down to who they are and the left or right will believe in them whichever one makes sense for their particular identity at the same time you know my findings suggest that that conspiracy thinking is equal between both sides but other people say it's asymmetrical this is going to get hashed out over time in the literature since you brought up trump specifically let me just he's sort of a special case here right and i think there what we've been finding as political scientists is that there is a distinction between trump supporters and republicans those can overlap but they're not necessarily the same thing right when trump got into the race he was up against conservative republican politicians who had experience he was not a conservative he was, he was labeled himself a republican but that was about it and he had no experience so given that he was up against 20 pretty good competitors, he had to do something to distinguish himself. So he went after those sorts of things that the other candidates couldn't. So he used conspiracy theories and other sorts of appeals, racial, gender, xenophobic appeals to build a coalition. So he was chasing a different Republican voter than Jeb Bush or Marco Rubio were. They were chasing different folks. And what we found in those primaries was that Trump supporters um, were much more conspiratorial in their thought processes than were uh, supporters of Jeb Bush or Rubio or John Kasich, the more mainstream Republicans, right? So now Trump wins, he's got to dance with the girl who brought him to the prom. So he continues on with the same rhetoric. And he is essentially reshaping the Republican Party with this new coalition of anti-establishment, conspiracy-minded folks. And January 6th is just a culmination of these forces. He built a coalition of people who think everything is rigged. He told them for years that elections are rigged. Then when he lost, he said, be at this place at this time. No one should be shocked that they, <laughs> that they rioted because he built this coalition of people with con, you know, conspiratorial worldviews, conflictual attitudes and dark personality traits. And that's, we got what we got. All right, Thank I think much. there's uh, a lot more questions in the chat. I'm, I'm actually gonna ask one quick. I'm, I'm aware that you might have to go soonish, so I'll make it quick. Um, Something that I think I, I noticed was that in your polling, uh, in your polling, it makes sense that I guess uh, we're seeing that it's it's flat in terms of the conspiracy belief over time. But I think the danger that I would identify is not that you're getting a wider proportion of people believing these conspiracy theories, that, but that within the people that believe in the conspiracy theory, 
their view becomes more cemented and more radical. So I was wondering what data have you looked into, into how within those people that say they believe in QAnon, you might have those that just think, okay, I believe that there's some deep state, and then there might be some people that think we need to hang Mike Pence, and what kind of difference that makes, and also then how social media plays into that, because I think that's the danger, it's that echo chamber, those people that get into that community, and then that leads to more radical thinking compared to it being spread to a wide proportion of people. So, um, if everyone acted on their conspiracy theories in some deleterious way, the streets would run red with blood, but they don't. Everybody believes one conspiracy theory or a couple. Some people believe a lot of conspiracy theories, but most people aren't acting on these beliefs in any meaningful way, right? But some people are. Um, most QAnon believers are not doing anything about it. They're not rioting, they're not killing people, they're not engaging in terrorism or, you know, but a small number are, right? So the, you know, the question is how do we identify those folks, right? So we need to think about a few things. You know, most believers in Kennedy conspiracy theories are harmless and we find that belief in those theories are not correlated with people who wanna do violence or act conflictually or or with dark personality traits. But people who think no one died at Sandy Hook or that the Holocaust was faked, we do find that those folks tend to have darker personality traits, they're more prone to conflict, um, and they are more likely to say that they support political violence. Now, again, I'm doing this on surveys, which is different than, you know, I'm getting attitudes on a survey towards committing violence. It's not the same as actually committing violence, but there is a subset of people who are comfortable with political violence for their particular ideas, right? Um, so that is a problem and we need, we need to deal with that, right? But that's not just the conspiracy theory. What that is, is the person is already conflictual and they have a set of traits and they're prone towards violence and they hate the establishment and they're antagonistic. They've got a whole bunch of things going on um, it's not just the idea. So ch changing somebody's mind on, you know, Sandy Hook or the Holocaust isn't necessarily going to change who they are as a person. It's just going to change their one view on that one thing. Um, but to your broader point about danger, my concern is when elite government elites use conspiracy theories to motivate masses, um, when they use them to craft policies, and when they, and when you know the strong use conspiracy theories to harm the weak, that's what scares me, right? But that's less about the conspiracy theory and a whole lot more about mendacious elites doing really bad things to vulnerable people. Thank you very much. I, I see four more questions in the chat. I don't know how how many more you. You think I'll, do, I'll do a lightning round so I can answer them all really quickly. <laughs> okay, um, so we'll just go in order in the chat. So first we have uh, Taran. Taran here. Uh, just, I, I think uh, the audio is a little muffled there, so I'll just repeat the question. How do you avoid uh, sampling bias in collecting your uh, polling data? So the so I've collected different sorts of surveys using different providers. Um, most of my surveys now are opt in so that they so that our samples are essentially matching the country in terms of their uh, education level, gender, income, race, and, and other characteristics. Um, so we're getting samples that look like the country, even though they're not you know, we're not randomly pulling people, people are opting in, um, so, sort of quota sampling. Um, but when, even when we do surveys that change the methodology, we're finding the same stuff. Um, so it's not, we're not finding big influences of the survey methodology on, on this. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, a massage. I'm really sorry if I butchered that, but. That's right, but thank you. Thank you for your lecture. I wanted to ask uh, about Watergate because I believe we all believe that such scandal could, couldn't le lead to a resignation of the president under President Trump. 
And what is the other explanation of this phenomenon other than the information bubbles that did not exist in 1970s? Because right now under President Trump, I feel and I guess we all believe that such a scandal would be rejected as a fake news and hoax by most Republicans. And how to explain this other than information bubbles? So who, so what belief are you concerned about, just so I understand? Mm, because the common I mean, conventional knowledge is that mm, Watergate could lead to resignation of the president mm -hmm. in the 1970s because we didn't have so many information bubbles. There were like three news networks and there okay. were kind of neutral widely accepted truth okay okay so i i i i think i i think i understand um i don't have a great answer for that i think polarization probably plays a pretty big role and if 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 i don't think it's the case that all the people who didn't want Trump impeached didn't have access to accurate information about what was going on. It said it was just their dispositions that led them to reject the information that they had. So to me, it's not so much of an information bubble, it's just strong disposition saying, you know, we don't believe what you're saying on the left because you have your own biases and you're out to get Trump and we're not going to listen to you. Now, the same thing went on on the other side. I mean, there were strong excesses, whatever we want to say about Trump, there were excesses on the left in the US in sort of thinking about what Trump may or may not have done wrong. And those still persist. I mean, even after the Mueller investigation, I mean, there were, there were mainstream media accounts saying, Trump has been a Russian agent for 40 years. Mueller didn't find any evidence of that, right? But news outlets are still saying this from time to time. And even now we're having arrests of people who were involved in um, planting the steel dossier, um, which turns out to be largely misinformation and fake. So, you know, I don't want to both sides it. Um, you know, certainly I think it's unfortunate that Republicans in Congress didn't vote to remove the president, um, particularly the second time when to me he was clearly guilty of instigating a riot, which led to the deaths of people, and he should have been removed from office. Um, but on the other hand, I think there's a lot of people on the other side of believing things that aren't necessarily true, too, who are getting their own information from their own sources. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next is it. That, uh, that wasn't lightning round. That was no. <laughs> so now the lightning round begins. <laughs> OK, well, Simon uh, is next. I noticed you've maybe asked a few questions, so maybe Try to try keep it lightning, lightning round. Uh, yeah, I wondered if there was a trend in how individual conspiracies are believed over time. Do they die out? Is it purely down to coverage or? Yeah, so it seems to be the case that they, you know, your median conspiracy pops up and it dies on the vine. You'll never hear about it. People are propagating these ideas all the time. If you go onto Twitter at 3 a.m., you'll find conspiracy theories there, and then by sunup, they're gone. They don't catch on. It's only a very small number that we will poll on or that people will write books about or be concerned about. Um, so most die. Uh, for those that take off, it looks like that there is something of a decay function over time. But with that said, um, if elites start talking about a particular conspiracy theory, then that conspiracy theory will probably um, become salient, at least with those who are listening to those elites. So if Republicans all started talking about Freemasons tomorrow and saying, watch out for the Freemasons, then uh, my polls on Freemasons will probably pop for the next few years. Thank you very much. And final one, we have um, Follow Can Me. Sorry again. If Pronunciation. Yeah, that was a that was a good pronunciation. Uh, thanks a lot, Joe, for the um, presentation. You've made me challenge a lot of my sort of preconceptions. Uh, I just had one question about the flat Earth uh, conspiracy. Um, I noticed you didn't 
cite any data on it, but I was wondering if there was anything like that available that shows the rate of belief over time. So I don't poll on on it. I haven't. Um, it doesn't particularly concern me that much. I have seen polls where it's you know four or five six percent. Um, I saw one poll from France a couple of years ago where it was I think ten percent. Um, it, it's it's always a close call, but with my surveys, I try not to put things that I think are too wacky because I get a little bit nervous about a survey respondent starting to take the poll as a joke and start just giving dumb answers. Um, so for some things that might interest me but are too weird, I I, I just I'm not going to spend survey space on them. But that's one of them. My guess is to have to believe in flat Earth, you have to you know, you have to have a pretty strong conspiratorial disposition, but probably some other dispositions too. Maybe you have a set of biblical beliefs, you know, God is holding up our flat earth. Um, you have to be very much against scientific authority because pretty much all of science is wrong. <laughs> um, and um, you probably have some paranormal and supernatural beliefs going on there, um, going on there too. All right, thank you very much. And thank you so much for answering everyone's questions. Uh, so but I you know, as they say, I'll leave you with this, you know, as they say, uh, flat earth beliefs are popular all around the world. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much to everyone who attended. Uh, I'd like to remind you one more time, we've got uh, another event in a week. Where we've got uh, Color Black discussing the true value of skepticism. And that's on the 16th at 6 p.m. So hope to see uh, some of you there. And uh, yeah, once again, uh, huge thanks to Joe for a fascinating talk and thanks to everyone who attended. Thanks so much. Have a good one.